but at the very beginning, there's this, there's this union between people from very different backgrounds. Dorothy Day was, was an urbanite. She was born into a middle-class family, but she rebelled. And, you know, Peter Morin was this guy from a dinky, you know, rural French village in the middle of nowhere in Southern France, who lived a very, very different life, but who felt compelled to leave his home. So, so just a little bit about Dorothy Day's background, because I wanna emphasize this, this is somewhat de-emphasized right now to a certain extent, because she's, um, she's in the process of, of canonization, right? The, the Catholic Church is seriously considering um, canonizing Dorothy Day, in, in other words, making her a saint, and that's ongoing right now. Um, and so, yes, you will learn that she was, you know, her background was not terribly orthodox until she converted, but it's actually kind of difficult to um, uncover some of these details. She was a rebellious young woman at a time when most women wouldn't dare to do almost any of the things that she did. Um, she left her home. She was absorbed by, um, you know, socialist and communist ideas that were in the air, anti-capitalist ideas. Um, she joined the socialist movement and she got into radical journalism and she lived life large, you know, for better or worse, she lived life large. So when she was young, for instance, she fell in love with um, this guy, Lionel Moyes, and became pregnant at the age of 22. She followed him to Chicago where she had a traumatic abortion. Um, and then in the wake of that, um, she had a couple of suicide attempts and she, had a, and, and she quickly glommed on to Berkeley Toby who actually ends up being married something like seven times or more. So she was one of, of his um, serial marriages and she says that she married Berkeley on the rebound for money, for, for basically security. Um, and Amon Hennessy wrote, Hennessy wrote that the marriage was dissolved and she rarely spoke of Berkeley again. It was, it was, it was a short marriage. Um, so, you know, you can begin to sense the turmoil of this young woman in her, in her youth. The abortion was of course illegal. Um, but she got it anyway. And it was obviously something that um, was deeply traumatizing to her, that it was probably why the suicide attempts. Another incredible living large thing about Dorothy Day is she published a novel called The Eleventh Virgin, which I have not read, um, but maybe I will, um, which was actually bought by Hollywood and allowed her to buy a cottage on Staten Island Imagine how much that's worth now if it's still there, right? <clears throat> and there she lived with a man named Forster Batterham, who was, who was a great love, oh, somebody that she truly loved and was truly um, very simpatico with. A, um, they uh, had a child together, Tamar, and she was born in 1926. And I don't think that Dorothy Day ever um, stopped loving him. Okay, but uh, Forrester was a bohemian, radical kind of socialist guy, and he just was not going to see himself clear to getting married. Marriage wasn't, on principle, wasn't in his wheelhouse. And she knew that from the beginning, but she tried to get him to marry her because she had converted to Catholicism. A little bit more on that in a second. But when she converted to Catholicism, she realized, I need to marry the father of my child, and he refused. And so she left him. Um, so, I mean, Dorothy Day has this background that is kind of Augustinian. If you look at um, the Confessions by Augustine, you find that he had an affair with a woman that he carried on for years. He had a child by her. But then all of a sudden he converted and he realized that he couldn't stay with this woman. And he, his whole life changed. 
And one of the after one of the effects of that is rightly or wrongly, he left that woman. Okay. And this is what Dorothy Day did as well. Um, she was divorced um, technically because of the previous guy that she married, but, she, but you know, it was really almost doesn't sound like it was much of a relationship. So, you know, how did this happen? How did Dorothy Day become somebody who actually was devoted to the Catholic Church and um, who was completely devoted to charitable works and changing the world and now somebody who's being considered for sainthood? Well, she says that the birth of her daughter had a lot to do with it. Um, that when her daughter was born, she felt the need to raise her in a religion because she realized that this was that this was needed for her child to not live the kind of bohemian loose life that she had lived. She wanted something better for her child. So that's what she says. People around her say that she always, even when she was a pretty dyed in the wool socialist, she was always somewhat religiously inclined, though there was a part of her that, um, that was curious about God, that thought of higher transcendent things. And so it didn't come as a surprise to them that she eventually converted. So there's both of those things. But by the time that she met Peter Morin, or Moran, depending on your pronunciation, um, she'd already converted. She was four years into her conversion and they met in 1932. She was 35 years old and Peter Morin was um, 57 years old. And this is her writing in The Long Loneliness about this, how this happened. And she says, the night I met Peter, I had come from an assignment from for the Commonweal, which is a, a, a sort of progressive um, Catholic journal covering the communist inspired hunger march of the unemployed to Washington. I had prayed at the shrine of the Immaculate Conception on the feast of the Immaculate Conception and that I might find something to do in the social order besides reporting conditions. I wanted to change those conditions, not just report them, but I had lost faith in the revolution. I wanted to love my enemy whether capitalist or communist. This was during the rise of communism, right? And the big clash between capitalism and communism. It turns out that George Schuster of Commonweal had told Peter Morin that, she, that he needed to go see Dorothy Day because they were in similar, you know, they were in a similar frame of mind. And he had literally like just shown up at her doorstep and from then on, basically, Peter Morin would just appear, walk into the apartment and just start talking. And Peter Morin was, um, if nothing else, like a huge talker, <laughs> okay? That was, his, that was his main strength is that uh, by all accounts, you know, he was extremely convicted and he would talk nonstop and he was very persuasive, apparently. She says in The Long Loneliness, Peter was very much afraid of class war. And after his first essays were published, he could not quite understand why I wrote so much about inter interracial just injustice, hard conditions of labor, inadequate housing. He much preferred to write about how things should be, houses of hospitality for the needy, charity exercised in every home, voluntary poverty and the works of mercy farming communes and agronomic universities that would teach people to earn a living by the sweat of their own brows instead of someone else's. So you can see right there, you know, there was this not always, you know, uh, not always completely compatible mashing together of two different backgrounds, two different ways of life, two different knowledge sets, okay? Two different worldviews in a way came together here but they shared a common concern for the poor. They shared their Catholicism. Um, Peter Morin gave Dorothy Day the opportunity to learn much more about the Catholicism that she had um, converted to because he came packing with all this Catholic social thought, particularly inspired by 
Leo the 13th and Rerum Novarum um, and the ongoing Renaissance in the French Catholic Church. More about Peter Morin in, in just a bit. But as far as day goes, focusing in on her for a second here, her post-conversion priorities were, believe it or not, okay, daily communion and the rosary. Okay, she was extremely devout, right? She turned into an extremely devout person for whom that daily communion was essential for getting through the rest of her day, especially as she turned towards serving the poor, the indigent, doing that kind of hard work. She drew from this daily mass. She was dedicated still to radical journalism. It changed its temperament from a sort of socialist slash communist leaning to more of Catholic social teaching as she learned more from Peter Morin. But at the same time, it never totally lost the edge that she had learned as she was very pro-labor and she was probably less skeptical of labor movements than Peter Morin was. Um, so, so what you see in the Catholic workers newspaper as far as her writing is that she did carry forward a lot of that knowledge, which I would argue is pretty good. Like it's essential to understanding um, capitalist economics, the stuff that she learned from, um, you know, from her reading of, of Marx and Marx, Marxist thinking. It helped her to understand capitalist economics. And she moved that forward and modified it as she integrated it with Catholic social teachings brought by Peter Morin. Um, she was very dedicated to what she called the revolution of the heart. That is that true conversion would bring about this desire for solidarity with all human beings, including the poor, the downtrodden, the outcast, service to them, and most of all, genuine love for them, which was not an afterthought, but the sort of the core and the essence of everything else that people should do. The poor, she thought, and we touched on this before, were seen as Christ. In other words, the poor were our opportunity to, to be with Christ and to serve Christ in voluntary poverty. She advocated voluntary poverty to be on a level with the poor, to experience as much as possible, it's not possible completely, but to experience that kind of precarity that they experienced and to put no barrier between them, um, the Catholic worker and those whom they served. She also was deeply committed to racial equality and racial integration at a time when neither one of those things was hardly on the radar screen and to pacifism. And it was pacifism, her pacifism was the thing that most put her into contradiction with the, with the Catholic church. Um, they did not like her position of pacifism because it wasn't the official position of the church which stems from just war teaching and is more amenable to backing war efforts if they are defensive and so forth. Her complete pacifism was too much for Catholic authorities to take sometimes and they would chastise her and even went so far as to say, we really don't want you to call the Catholic worker newspaper Catholic because it really doesn't represent what we are or what we, what we stand for. Now, you know, her approach to this was to sort of take it in stride and to kind of bear with the Catholic church um, and to try to remonstrate with them to hopefully you know, have an influence on them. So she basically just put up with that and it, it turned out they mainly put up with her, but they didn't. But this might be part of why ultimately the Catholic church does not four square back the Catholic worker movement. Um, so, Here's Doroth, the, um, a statement from the Dorothy Day Guild, which was, um, which was instituted to support the cause of her um, canonization. And this is basically um, a quote from Dorothy Day. She says, 
Whatever I had read as a child about the saints had thrilled me. I could see the nobility of giving one's life for the sick, the maimed, the leper. Priests and sisters the world over could be working for the littlest ones of Christ, and my heart stirred at their work. But there was another question in my mind. Why was it so was so much done in the remedying of the evil instead of avoiding it in the first place? Where were the saints to try to change the social order, not just to minister to the slaves, but to do away with slavery? Of course, the, the common answer to that is the poor will always be with you. Obviously, Dorothy Day didn't take that as a ticket to do nothing about the situation. She felt that a Christian's duty was to try as best they could to change the overall social structure so that there was less suffering poverty uh, and we were able to treat our brothers and sisters more as um, complete equals and children of God. Dorothy Day Guild says she set herself against a social order which made so much charity in the present sense of the word necessary. In other words, she combined the practice of charity with the struggle for justice. This has always caused controversy. As Dom Helder Camara, Brazilian Catholic Archbishop, who brought a preferential option for the poor to the center of the Christian social thinking, once said, when I give food to the hungry, they call me a saint. When I ask why the poor are hungry, they call me a communist. So Dorothy Day, um, she understood that reaction was going to be very common. She understood that she was living at a time when, you know, capitalist versus communist, that that was the binary that was going on. And so it was very difficult for people to understand that you could be neither of those things, but still feel as though Christians ought to do everything they can to truly change the um, the situation of the poor in their midst through their own actions, right? So she just had to keep going um, with that misunderstanding and do the best she could. But um, this has definitely carried through the Catholic worker movement is this preference for action, right? Not being satisfied with simply charity, but um, wishing to um, and trying to change the social order for, through a variety of means, which, which we'll discuss um, in a little bit. So Peter Morin, well, Peter, you know, when they came together, in addition to, you know, wanting to school Dorothy Day, he basically gave her like a, a crash course in Catholic social teaching. Uh, he urged her to start the newspaper, which was a no brainer for her because she was a journalist and she always wanted to start a newspaper. So that was not a problem. Where the money was going to come from, that was a little bit of a question. Um, but Peter Morin's idea of what that newspaper should be is mainly a vehicle for his easy essays. He was writing these essays um, designed kind of aimed at um, the blue collar working class that boiled down a lot of Catholic, Catholic social thought into a language that, that anybody could grasp and was seemingly very rational. And he wanted that newspaper to, re, to basically publish those and to get that out on the streets. Um, Dorothy Day, because of her own you know, background and agenda, wanted to publish his easy essays, but also wanted to continue to report on social conditions and movements of resistance. And I have to tell you, like having read about Peter Morin and like his, I don't know, his approach, both with the easy essays and just um, with talking to people generally, he really thought he was absolutely right. And that there wasn't anything necessary other than what he said <laughs> to like basically convert people and get them to do the right thing. So I say there's a reason why Dorothy is up for sainthood 